Before we dive in, this week's episode is brought to you by my free cheat sheet, 30 Top Tips to Find Time to Write. In this guide, I give you 30 ways that you can find time to write in the small gaps that appear between the various errands and tasks and responsibilities that you have in your day-to-day -day life. Now, you might be thinking that you don't have any time to spare, but I can guarantee these top tips will give you writing time you didn't think you had. If you thought writing always involved a pen and paper or a keyboard, think again. If you thought you needed at least an hour at a time to write your manuscript, I help you reframe that. You won't be disappointed. Get your free copy of 30 top tips to find time to write by going to emmadesi.com forward slash 30 top tips. Okay, let's dive in to today's episode. Tiffany Obeng was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Since fourth grade, she knew she wanted to become a lawyer and an author. However, from that young age, she pursued becoming a lawyer because becoming a lawyer meant a lot both to her and to her family. In 2009, she fulfilled her destiny and graduated from a top tier law school and went on to pursue a fulfilling legal career. In 2020, during the pandemic, Tiffany decide to finally pursue her other dream of becoming an author. She researched publishing companies to hopefully work with but realised quickly that as a no-name, first-time and minority author, a traditional publishing route was not really available to her. Tiffany turned her research efforts to creating her own imprint and went into authorship and publication independently. She released her first book in the career book series, Andrew Learns About Actors, in August 2020. The concept was inspired by her and her son's shared enjoyment of TV and reading books. Six months later, Tiffany published Andrew Learns About Teachers, inspired by the teachers in her family and throughout her life. So I'm going to find out more about Tiffany today, and I'm really looking forward to it, um, and particularly about the imprint that she has started. That's something um, I've thought about at a big, big distance. I have to admit, I feel quite intimidated at the thought of that. So um, I'm really keen to hear what Tiffany has to say about it and what she can teach me. All right, let's dive in. Well, Tiffany, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to learning more about you. Same. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I thought um, it would be lovely just to hear a little bit about your journey to writing because um, it's sort of a second career for you, I understand. That is correct. So my first career is as an attorney. So um, I do employment discrimination mainly. So I advise like the institution that I work at about complying with equal opportunity laws. So making sure they're hiring people and retaining people and promoting people, et cetera, uh, without regard to their race, gender, national origin, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But as a second career, as you said, <laughs> I um, write children's books, children picture books, and they're usually for the lower level. So probably about preschool, depending on what book you pick up, but preschool to about second or third grade. And what I love about doing this is almost similar to my journey as an, uh, an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, I'm able to put out products that fill a gap that um, educate, inspire, and normalize Black children. So I don't know if anyone can see me, which they can't because we're not being video <laughs> recorded, but I'm African-American and I have two children, um, small children. One is Andrew, he's six years old currently. Then I have a little tiny uh, daughter and she's 16 months. Okay. And so they're Black. And so it's just really important to me for them to have literature that represents them and to just put out literature that represents a gamut of people, um, especially that's already underrepresented in literature. Well, yes, because you're, um, you're on your website, you've mentioned that there are more children's books featuring animals than people of colour. So this is obviously, yeah, absolutely an issue that you're very keen to address. Um, and so, you know, when you're when you're at your local bookstore or even on Amazon looking for books for your kids, presumably you don't, there's not many that are reflecting your children back at them. Right. So there has been progress, especially now that independent authors, self-published authors like myself um, have gotten into the writing publishing game. Mm -hmm. um, there is an increase, but we're still lacking. Yes. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And is so, that just, is that sort of solely with um, uh, Amer- <laughs> African-Americans uh-huh. uh, or is that also with, you know, like Mexican-Americans or um, Indian-Americans and, and different cultures as well? Yes, you're right. So they have this acronym um, B-I-P-O-C. So it's Black, Indigenous, People of Color. And that group or group of people are really lacking in literature, children's literature, which is my focus. Um, And so there is a push in the United States. Um, I just recently realized in um, United Kingdom as well, parts of Canada. And I say I just realized because I was like, why does UK and Canada buy my books? (laughs) Like so almost on the same par as USA. And so I looked it up and I was like, oh, they also are trying to fill a gap. Like they're interested in that as well. So... (laughs) Well, there you go. Supply and demand. Clearly, people are are looking for what you're you're filling. So that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um. So so that this so but this is all new for you, isn't it? Because this started in the pandemic. Is that right? Yes. 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 So this is fairly new. It's been um, two years now. So <clears throat> August 2020 was my first time publishing any book of any sort. And at the time, I thought it was just going to be a bucket list type situation. Even though I don't really know why I say that, because I knew I was going to do at least four books, but but I didn't think I was going to go from one book to 16 books in two years. You know, I did not fathom that at all. But yeah, August 2020, I published my very first book. It was called Andrew Learns About Actors. It was inspired by my son, Andrew. He was four at the time. He still, just like his mom, loves to interact with the TV characters, And so I just wondered, like, does he know that these characters are like played by actors? They're not real people. And how do you explain that to a child, especially during the pandemic as well? Um, Black Panther or the guy who played Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman, died. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do we explain to children the difference between the two? Or they had this movie that just came out that was nominated for Oscar King Richard that was played Mm -hmm. by Will Smith. And my son, while he was watching the Serena sisters or Williams sisters, he's like, oh, they're grown. I'm like, yeah, this is just a movie about them. <laughs> so he's like, who are these people? So uh... <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? That sense of perspective and just yeah. accepting face value that grown ups have always been grown ups and um, <laughs> that they don't change. I remember uh, years ago now, I did a, I used, I did a, I was an actor and I did a schools tour around schools in Scotland and we were doing it about history, about Robert the Bruce, who's quite a famous character here. And part of the set was to have this um, fake tombstone. So it just sat on the, the school hall and was a bit, you know, it was a prop. And I remember we finished and we were wrapping up and some kids were walking through. They must have been, you know, five, six years old, walking through the hall. And I picked up the tombstone to put it away. And they were like, oh, how did you do that? You know, because they just they genuinely believed that somehow this tombstone had arrived yeah. in their yeah. school hall. But I just love that. It was, a, I hadn't appreciated that children what they see is what they see mm-hmm. and it takes time and maturity to have that that kind of perspective and um, so yeah great inspiration there to see that <laughs> your son <laughs> was you know make trying to make that difference between a character being played and then yeah in real life yeah so you did mention there that you have published what was it 16 books in two years at this time yes wow. <laughs> as of today <laughs> <laughs> So how has that been? You know, that is a rapid release, a very rapid release. And what have you found to be the benefits to releasing books so so quickly? Yeah, so the benefit is being able to, I mean, of course, we want to make money. <laughs> I'm not going to act like I'm Mother Teresa or something. I want to make money as well. So one of the benefits is just being able to diversify the in- interests so people can buy. So Andrew learns about actors. People may not want an actor book. But they might be looking for an engineer book. They may be looking for a lawyer book. What I've learned um, when I started rapid releasing, which wasn't my intention, it just happened because I got inspired and was really creative at the time. And so 
things just started coming to me and I was able, and I guess we'll get into it, but I was able to assemble the teams and stuff to get things rolling even quicker. Because people always say like, how do you do that? How do you release so many books? <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, just knowing that there's a gap. So I do research, market research. Andrew Learns About Actors was inspired by my son. That whole Andrew Career Day series is inspired by my son. But the books that come that's not Andrew Career Day uh, related are inspired by market research. What are people looking for? What are people wanting? And so Scott's Honor, a kid's book about lying and telling the truth, that was inspired by market research. People were looking for books about lying. And then I would read about like, well, what do they want in a book about lying? And so just taking those, what I've learned and then putting out a book. And then I say, you know what? I want to write something else. So I'll go back and do some research. <laughs> or, or my son will do something and I'm like, okay, well, let me see. What's the book about it? Or maybe we do need a book about it. So it's just filling the gaps of information. And then of course, because I do, uh, my main characters are African-American children. I'm just really into filling that gap, like having them seen, having them in normal situations with the Scots Honor book about lying. Um, I like when people say, oh, it's just a little boy running around a house who accidentally breaks a lamp. That's the setting for it. He um, accident, he's running around with a cape <laughs> like any other little boy and his cape hits the lamp off the um, table and it breaks. So now he has to decide if he's going to tell the truth or tell a lie to his parents mm -hmm. on how the lamp broke. And so just for people to say, oh yeah, that's like a normal thing for a child to do. That really uh, is fulfilling. Yeah. And, and being able to, I guess, because, you know, it's adults who are buying the book. So they want mm -hmm. to see something that a lesson that they want to teach and absolutely knocking something over, breaking it and then, OK, what can I make up? It was yeah. my imaginary friend. He did it. Was it me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I recognize that at all. Uh, uh, very, very well. So you've brought up three great uh, things here that I'd love just to delve into a little bit more. I first of all applaud you for saying I want to make money because this is something that a lot of writers in the space that I'm in anyway are very almost embarrassed to admit kind of don't want to talk about the fact they do want to make a good living it's almost like oh well if I if I if I reduce this to financial terms, then it's not art anymore, um, or it doesn't feel that it's coming from my heart as much. Um, I, so I just want to kind of applaud you and recognize that you're understanding the value of what you're producing and putting into the world and that it does have a value and that you should be paid accordingly. So that's really important to recognize. I'm really fascinated too by the market research you've done as well. So as you've said, like a big part of your uh, drive and remit is to fill gaps. So for those people who haven't even thought about doing any kind of research for their books, um, could you just give us maybe a couple of uh, a couple of steps that you would do in order to find where the, the gap is? Yeah, so one very simple way, uh, cost effective and everything, you don't have to pay for any tools to see what people are wanting for children's books, um, my expertise, if you will, is children's books. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this would apply to a genre of book, any genre of book, is to go on Amazon, the largest search engine, type in <laughs> books about and see what populates. So um, at least in .com, I use Amazon.com. So for me, right now, I'm going to see books about fall and I have a fall book coming out. That's, I think that's my 16th book. Has it, I have it coming out like tomorrow. <laughs> so, ah. <laughs> but that's been in the making. But it's just that like books about fall is starting to trend. So that's a book that people are going to want. One caveat to that is because it's a season, it's going to trend for the season. It's going to come back down. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to care about it anymore for the most part. But um, you type that in, books about divorce, books about lying. For children's books, I know, I realized that a lot of books that people are consistently looking for and wanting are what they call SEL type books, social emotional learning books. And so those are like, how do I make a friend? How do I stop bullying? How do um, the honesty book? Um, things like that. They also like books about difficult discussions. So mm -hmm. how do I have a conversation or tell my children about divorce? Um, how do I have a conversation about, um, what else is something that's tough? Just, oh, where your hands should go. People shouldn't touch your body. How do I talk to my children about that? Mm -hmm. So Amazon typing it in to see what people are looking for because it will auto-populate like the top searches. Uh -huh. And that's how I get a kind of start. And if I have like, um, if I'm inspired by the search results, 
then I can kind of move forward from that. But if I'm not, I'm just like, okay, well, another day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And so do you then have a look at the book covers, say, within that's just to see, okay, can I, is there a gap here? So after, so the book about lying, I'll use that one because that was the first one that I did the market research to see what was going on. So books about lying. Okay, people are looking for that. Let me see exactly what they're looking for. Like, what do they like about the books about lying that's out? Mm-hmm. So I saw like the Berestein Bears. That's a really popular series. I grew up on Berestein Bears, but they have a line book. And so people were talking about, for instance, that they really love that book. It's like over 10, 2000 reviews on it. So just going through reviews and you're like, I like it because of X or I don't like it because of Y. And so just seeing what pieces they liked from the book and what they didn't like. Like one thing that they didn't like or prefer was that they wanted something more direct um, they didn't want too much of a story that lost the the meaning or the lesson they were trying to teach. Mm-hmm. Um, and they wanted something. And so when I researched other books about lying, they also wanted something that talks about um, the value of telling the truth. Why was telling the truth so important? Um, why is it bad to lie? So getting these little nuggets, I'm like, okay, I got you. I can do you <laughs> a lying book that you want, you know? And so uh, that's what I did. I crafted the lying book from those reviews. What did they like? What did they not like? And then to go forward, um, I don't know who will get there, but once you do that and you craft the book, then you got to make sure you optimize your Amazon page or whatever selling page. So you mm-hmm. can speak to the customer that was saying like, this is what I like about lying books. This is what I don't like. Mm-hmm. So um, that's how I use the research to make, create the book and position the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and well, <some> whatever <laughs> you're doing it's working I was having a look on Amazon and I can see that you were like number 1500 or something in the charts out of oh, wow you know over a million books so it was like so that is amazing um uh and then yes and then the other thing I wanted to ask you about which you touched on and I will I imagine um, does explain how you're man a- able to get these books out so rapidly as you talked about team now a lot of writers um think I've got to do it all by myself I've got to know everything um this is a I'm a you know it's a solitary endeavor I've got to do it by myself but you've mentioned there that you've got a team and this is how you're able to to work so swiftly so can you t- talk to us about your team who's involved how did you find them how did it grow Sure thing. So when I say team, I'm not talking about like having an in-house team. So I will clarify that. When I say team for children, picture books, I wish I could do my own illustrations, but (laughs) um, illustrations is a very important thing for children, pictures, picture books. And so I am able to source different illustrators. So when one illustrator is busy, then I source another illustrator, you know, just collecting different illustrators. So when I do have an aha moment, I have a book that I want to put out that I think can really benefit the world or whatever, or fill a gap. Um, I don't have to wait for an illustrator to become available Mm -hmm. for the most part. Like with my Andrew books, I keep that the same illustrator. So I do sometimes have to wait on her, but I'll also prepare. Like I have another Andrew book that I want to put out next year. So I'm already in talks with her like, hey, put me on your calendar for X amount of time so I can get that out. So just having... um, an idea of what I want in my illustrations and being able to find the illustrator that can deliver that and deliver it in a timely manner and uh, not being just held up on one illustrator has been really beneficial for me. That's one of the things, just having different illustrators, having different editors, having different layout typesetters and things like that, instead of relying on that same person. Of course, you have a good relationship with that person that you love. Like I love my illustrator for the Andrew books. I love her, she's so awesome. And I love my illustrators. I love all my illustrators, <laughs> but I'm like, uh, one, you don't want, all, I don't want all my books to look the same. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to kind of like diversify the illustrations, in my opinion. And two, she's busy. She's popular. So <laughs> It's a good sign. Yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah, so that's what I mean by having a team. There's people that I can reach out to um, and trust to do the illustrations or formatting or typesetting for my books. Yeah, because the formatting, I imagine, is quite tricky with the picture books and getting the page spread right, the the illustration in the right place and sort of bleeding, I guess, into the text. (laughs) Yes, that's right. And so um, I love an illustrator who is very familiar with that, Um, the whole process, like my Andrew illustrator girl, her name is Ira Bascofa. 
Beskova. <laughs> I'm probably saying it all wrong. She's Ukrainian. Um, so her, she's good. She's a one-stop shop, as in she has the illustration, she has the format, she has the typesetting. So all I have to do once I gather her, the, the files is upload. Um, but some illustrators I work with just provide the illustrations. And so that's where being a person like myself, I guess my background as an attorney, being able to research and figure out like, how do I make this work? So now that I've worked with illustrators that can do the one-stop shop and illustrators are just like, oh, here's your illustrations. I know what I need to get to the book format. Mm -hmm. So I know that I need to be familiar with book sizing. I know I need to be familiar with bleed. I know I need to be familiar with where my words are going to go on the page. Mm -hmm. So when that illustrator gives me something, especially for full page illustration or a spread, as you were mentioning, I need to be able to say, okay, well, this is where my words are going to go, you know, <laughs> and if it's not there, I need to say, hey, illustrator, I need you to move some things around because I need place for my words. Uh -huh. Some illustrators don't know that. And so for me being able, especially 16 books in, to know certain things that I need to look out for, that is very helpful as well. And so then I can take that and make it into a book. Um, I hope I'm answering the question. I'm like, did I get off topic? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's really because the formatting bit, I find it the trickiest bit in some ways. Um, and that's just for, you know, adult fiction, never mind mm -hmm. throwing illustrations into the mix. But it, then it's, you know, you you can see then from what you're sharing that time and experience means that you're getting more and more skilled at these jobs as well yes. um, and so you're learning from the people that you're working with and you know did it take time to build these relationships with your editors with your formatters um and or or did it happen just like that and it was all it was all good from the start I think for the people I work with repeatedly we have like a cordial relationship, like we follow each other on social media, we tag each other and things. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody I work with, they're not in the U.S. I'm in the U.S., so they're not in the U.S., they're all over the world. Um, so forming relationships, not personal relationships for the most part. I find my people on gig sites, mm -hmm. such as uh, Fiverr, such as Upwork. So that's where I find my people. That's where I'm comfortable with my people. Mm -hmm. And I say it like that, like I'm emphasizing that because there's a lot of negativity that's associated with gig sites. But what I love about gig sites is one, the variety of people you have that you mm -hmm. can find. Two, it's not limited to the USA. So I can go and get talent from anywhere. So again, that's widening, that's widening the pool. And um, three, they have built-in safeguards for you. So a lot of stories I hear from children picture book authors is that my illustrator ran away with my money <laughs> or my, you know what I mean? Yeah. My illustrator got paid this and didn't finish the work. My illustrator this, like they're having to track down their illustrator or start all over. Whereas when you work on these gig sites, they have like an escrow maybe account where you put your money, you pay your money, but the, comp the, the site pulls it until you accept delivery. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I love that. And because the gig sites are built and to have deliverables. So if I have an issue with an illustrator, which I've only had an issue one time, and that's when I first got in, when Andrew learns about actors, I didn't know what I was doing. So <laughs> I had an illustrator one time, and I was able to go to the gig site, people who manage it, and be like, I'm having this issue with my illustrator. And they tried to get it to like resolve, and it didn't resolve. So they were like, here's your money back. You can go on. And so I love that I know when I'm going to get my stuff. I know I have a way to get my stuff. And if I can't get my stuff, I can get my money back. So. <laughs> yeah. And that's really important, isn't it? Because it is, it's, it's an outlay that you're, it's an investment you're putting into your future book. So you want to know that you're working with good people. And so it's lovely to, that these relationships are building up over time. And then they know your style. You get to know how they work. And that it just smooths the whole process out. So that's really lovely. The other thing I'm... I'm always curious about is that you've got your own imprint. So tell me about that. How was that to set up? Was that easy? Do you publish other people's work or do you want to in the future? How does that work for you? Good question. So I set up an imprint because I learned I could do that without having to go through the rigmarole of formalizing, filing documents, if you will. Like I had to file a doing business as, but as far as like order articles of corporation or something, I didn't have to do that. Now, next year, I am going to look more into probably incorporating, but right now, I'm a sole proprietorship. I like it, and just having an imprint 
especially for an independent author, it makes you sound legit, if you will. <laughs> so <laughs> they're not like turning their noses up at you, like, oh, I'm not, my copyright, or not copyright, my ISBN is to Tiffany. Like, you're like, what is that? I, I don't know what that means. But if my ISBN is to Sugar Cookie Books, then we know like this is a real thing that's happening. So it just legitimizes you mm-hmm. and um, makes things a little bit more formal. And it's also branding. So mm-hmm. because I knew if I could, well, I didn't know if I was going to continue, but my husband was like, you have to incorporate, you have to do this like a business, 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 even from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to choose a name that I could possibly trademark or protect later on in life. Mm-hmm. Um, and just something that was uh, different. So mm-hmm. That's how sugar cookie books came about because I was just thinking like, how can I be different? I was reading, uh, what is it called? <laughs> Trademark for dummies or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were talking about like Apple computers and all the things. And I was like, how can I do something like Apple computers? And so that's how just creating the name. And then um, again, I was talking to like a, a person who had been in the publishing game for a little bit and she had an imprint. So I kind of understood like, oh, okay. So when you have an imprint, these are the type of things you can do with it. Um, it's not limiting really in a, in a sense, it's not limiting and it formalizes and legitimizes your business. So it was the easier way to go. And that's why I did it. And what was the other question? I think that was, it. oh yes. And do you plan to, if you don't already, do you plan to publish, um, other people's work? That's right. Um, publish other people's work under sugar cookie books. I think in the future. So what I want to happen, if I had to manifest, is Andrew Career Books to become like the the Britannica. So I don't know, is Britannica everywhere? Yes, I think it <laughs> okay, is. Okay. The encyclopedias. Yes, yes, yes. So I want to have at least 26 Andrew Career Day books. Um, but I'll kind of think about like Dr. Seuss and how he kind of uh, leased out his name, if you would, <laughs> and mm-hmm. like other authors wrote under his name. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, if <clears throat> I can't think of any more Andrew books to get to 26 or beyond, I don't want to limit it. And somebody's like, hey, I got a really good idea for an Andrew book. There may be something like that. If that makes sense. Ah, yes, yeah. that's a great idea. And I think it's done a lot, isn't it? Um, I can think of two series that I know more for middle grade books, but mm-hmm. um, I understand that the Warrior Cat books by Erin Hunter and then I, there's these books these um fairy books under the name of daisy meadows i think there's many authors involved in that and it's what a, what a sensible idea what a great way to maximize a yeah. brand and push it out there that's um such a smart idea and i love that you're manifesting things into the future it's something i talk about a lot with my audience about how it's so important to have a goal to have a dream and you get to take the steps towards it when you have it in your mind and uh, I also agree with your husband and think he was very sensible to say, yeah, let's treat this as a business. Because as soon as you hit publish, you're an entrepreneur, you're an authorpreneur. Um, so it's really important to have that mindset, I think. So well done you. Yay. Um, but you're not only an author, of course, you're a lawyer um, and you're a coach, a publishing coach. So my goodness, and you're a mother of two little people, very little people. Um, so how do you structure your day? How do you keep organized and make sure you get all the things done? That is like the million dollar question. (laughs) And I think the answer is, I'm like, how do I do it? Um, So I work during the day, obviously, but I don't have to commute. So I think that makes a bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. And also because I work from home, I'm not saying that I don't do my work when I'm working from home, but say I I go, um, I have a lunch break, then I have, I'm working from home. So if I have a thought or some inspiration or need to check off some illustrations or check off some formatting or upload something, I can do that. Versus if I was away in an office, I wouldn't have my personal <clears throat> computer or things to do that. So I think being able to work from home gives me that little bit of flexibility to take a few minutes here and there to check off on something or send some instructions on something or again, like publish on KDP or little odds and ends like that. Um, because I don't have a commute, when I get off at five, I'm able to take five to six thirty to do any real intense things that really might take some time. So, for instance, if I want to draft my Amazon book description, then I can use that time to do that. If I need to um, send off some emails to people, I can do that. So, like that business side, so we're an hour and a half for that. And then my husband is very involved with taking care of our children. 
So when he does finally get home, um, his schedule is not like a nine to five like mine. So his can go to nine, 10, but most days it's like to 7.30. So once he gets home at 7.30, um, we'll get the kids to bed and he actually puts our daughter to bed. So our son, I can read to him, he goes to sleep. <laughs> the daughter, you know, she still leaves a little rocking or whatever. Mm-hmm. So he could put her to sleep like around nine. And then I can, if I still have work to do, I can go back to doing some work from nine to 10 or nine to 11. I try not to be much after that. Um, But that's only when, I guess, like, also because we're doing this ourselves, we don't have that timeline. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to stay up to 11, 12 to get things done. Um, I can use bits and pieces of time to get things done. So affording myself that grace, like today, today is Labor Day in the United States that we're recording this and I'm not at work. We're not working. So I'm going to take this time to speak to you. And then after, I'm going to uh, put my fall book together. So hopefully it can be ready for people to see and buy and promote um, within a day or two. So I'm going to do that today. That's not work-wise. That's, you know, I'm not doing that on office time. On an office day, I'm doing it here. But that shouldn't take too long, hopefully. <laughs> and I can get back to enjoying the kids. But I do try to give myself grace. I do sometimes get writing assignments um, from companies. And so that kind of puts a wrench in things because that's when I really have to say, I have to take this time to do this. So I'm like away from my family a little bit more because I'm against their schedule. But when you're working for yourself, on yourself, on your schedule, Mm -hmm. you kind of just find the time to do it when you feel like doing it. I don't, I try to give myself grace um, if an idea inspires me. So for instance, um, one book I put out last week is called Black Boy Hair Joy. And that came about over the summer because uh, getting ready to take my son to summer camp and my mom, she comes to uh, help me with my daughter during the day since I work from home and we haven't put her in daycare yet. And so she comes over to help um, with my daughter and she was talking to my son while he was eating breakfast and she said something like, oh, someone's teasing your hair. So he has like curly hair on top and it's low on the sides. And um, he was like, yeah, they're calling me curly head or something. (laughs) And so I was like, oh man, I'm like, oh, do I need to make, I just, was joking I was like do I need to make a book to celebrate black boys hair and then I st- went and started thinking I was like wait <laughs> do I need to make a book to celebrate? <laughs> and so uh, over the course of time as things would come to me I would jot it down on my phone my little notepad on the phone like little uh, it's written in rhyme, in rhyme so I'll say verses so little verses I'll put in my phone and then I'll think about it like another hairstyle I made like a list of hairstyles I did it in my phone and I put it to the side and then as little things will come I'll write it down put it to the side and so just to, if I'm watching tv with my husband if it came to me I'll write it down and then went back to watching tv and mm-hmm. so it wasn't until it actually became like a manuscript that I could actually go through and look through that I had to come to the computer and be like oh let me focus on this but yeah so just giving myself the space and when it, it hits me then I write it down and then we continue on. Um, and I think that can apply to any genre, you know, instead of, some people say, well, sit for 30 minutes and just type, type, type. But, and I think that's good advice, but I also think that I don't want to be stressed out. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I don't want as an independent author to let this stress me out because it's not my full-time gig. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a full-time gig and I don't allow that to stress me out. So I'm not going to allow something that I do for passion to become something that I hate. So like I took a creator break um, after I released Two Houses Down, the divorce book. I released it in March and then I took a break. I was like, I'm done because I just need to regroup. (laughs) It was a lot of books. I did like eight books in six months. So I was like, I need to regroup. I need to just chill out. And my brain is fried actually. So Mm -hmm. my, my mom and my husband were like, but summer's coming up. I have a summer series. They're like, summer's coming up. You need the summer book. And I was like, I can't give you a summer book. I have nothing to give. I'm not going to just put summer, summer, summer on a page. (laughs) So I went on break for, how long was it? March, April, May. I think I put put out the bilingual book in July. So it was like four months. And then I came back with five more books. And so... (laughs) So Isn't that... so telling the power of actually switching off the power of kind of stepping away for a bit to give yourself that white space yes to be creative yes 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 like I would that's probably like the best advice I don't know if anybody gave me that advice but this is advice I would give to any creator especially like and we're doing it on our own like we're not working for a publishing company like we're working for ourselves Mm -hmm. so if you need to step away step away 
yeah. I, I joke about myself because I'm like, it's not like I'm Dr. Seuss. Nobody's just like banging down my door and waiting for me to <laughs> put out something. <laughs> like, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. So I'm just like, I can step away. I can take that time. And you don't want to burn out. This is a mm. creative space. So you have to allow your juices, creative juices to flow when they're flowing. And if they're not flowing, it's okay. It is really okay. They will flow again. They really will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I love um that you have because you know I I do hear this phrase if you want something done ask a busy person because they will you know get that fitted in and so I I appreciate the fact that you've been yes you've got a full-time job and you've got two little kids but you're finding those gaps in your day you're finding those moments in your day that lets you step in and just do a little bit at a time but it's that compound effect if you keep doing a little bit a little bit eventually that becomes a lot and even if it's just to jot down ideas so if Yep. You know, if any of our listeners are writing adult fiction where, the, you know, there's bigger chunks of text, even just having ideas for what could be in a scene or what could happen with a character, it's a lot of writing is the thinking that goes behind putting the words on the page. Yes. So really inspirational there that you're finding, you, you're making that time in your day to to do what you love. And, and as you say, it's a passion. So you want to enjoy it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, now you've been inspired, I know, by Maya Angelou, who said, when you learn, teach. So who, hel- who else has been an inspiration to you and has kind of made you realize, yeah, I'm going to teach. <laughs> um, so she's really big in the publishing industry, especially for children picture books for black girls. Her name is Crystal Swain Bates. And she's like all over Amazon. She's like all over Ingram Spark. One of her one of her biggest books is called Hey Pretty Princess. And she said, I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> I mean, I guess I can tell her this part of her story, but she said she put that out because when her brother was having her niece, um, she realized there weren't any, this is like back in 2013. So she realized there weren't any books with black princesses. So she was like, I'll create a book, <laughs> you know. So she does a lot of teaching now, teaching, mentoring, a lot of classes, and she has a group and things, Facebook group and things. And so I am inspired by her because one, she was able to become so successful in this space. And I shouldn't even put quotes around it because she sold over 600,000 books at this point. Wow. <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah. And she, is she indie published? Yes. Good yes, for her. Yes. <laughs> so she sells those books and she, I was listening to one of her free courses because she likes to encourage and be able to get other people to you don't have to sell 600,000 books but if this is what you want turn your passion into profit that's her saying now uh, so she puts out these master classes and I was just listening to all of them going back listening to all of them and she was like helping with the tips and tricks that she used and so she was one of the people that taught told us about researching finding out what's hot like you can write books that you're passionate about that's great but if you want to make some money you need to make sure either that book that you're passionate about is something other people are passionate about <laughs> and or you just do other books as well and so Scouts Honor was my um my venture into like let me see. Let me see if she knows what she's talking about. And she did. And so I was like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. Um, but yeah, so she's empowering authors to, you know, turn their passion into profit. And she's like, you know, you have to publish more than one. She didn't say publish more than one in like six months, but <laughs> she was like, don't do just what. And I guess I just took that and ran so far with it. But yeah. that's something I, someone I look up to and a lot of us look up to, um, Again, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so important, isn't it? I think it's one of the wonderful things that the indie space has brought. So, so many people are so, I don't want to use the word grateful, but they're so appreciative of what uh, indie publishing has brought them. Uh, There are so many six-figure authors out there who nobody's ever heard of apart from their diehard fans. But just because they're not in Barnes & Noble or in Waterstones doesn't mean they are not there writing great books um and that's one thing i enjoy about the indie space is that there are people who are kind of want to want want to inspire others to come up behind them to be part of this big conversation um the global conversation of literature in all its forms so it's lovely to hear that she's doing that too and and i noticed on your website too that you are also doing this because you um you're helping aspiring authors as well 
Yeah, because again, when you learn, teach. And so I, again, I know I don't mind researching. I don't learn, I don't mind teaching myself. But some people are like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to come through all that stuff. I don't want to have to read. You know, I just want someone to hold my hand and take me along. And so I'll do that. I will hold your hand and bring you along. I will tell you the first step and the next step. I will answer all your, I will be at your beck and call. So uh, (laughs) just understanding that people are not going to do all the things that I did, like studying and stuff. They sometimes want a, they may not want to pay a publishing agency to Mm -hmm. just take the whole thing, but they also don't want to just hit the ground running by themselves. So I'm like that middle person, like you still want to do it yourself. You still want to learn it yourself, but you don't want to have to sit through a lot of information to learn it yourself. Because ultimately my goal as being a coach is to empower you to be able to do it on your own. So you can just keep going and going and going. And so you can watch out for the pitfalls when you have publishing agencies or companies saying, hey, I'll publish your book and I'll be your publisher taking your stuff. Um, um, and all you have to do is pay me <laughs> money. And it's like, don't do that don't do that so um so it's the publishing that you focus on so they've written their book and now they want to publish it and that's you coach them on the publishing side yes yes so it's copyrights people have a lot of questions about copyrights how do I get my ISBN how many do I need um okay so what does it mean when I have ISBN you know yeah it's a good question yeah Yeah. it's not always (laughs) clear is it and is that do you specialize in working with other children's book authors or do you work with authors across across the genres and age groups Uh, children's books mainly I do help a little bit with um other genres as far as like the very basics of things which everything is pretty much the same except for the illustrations but I think because my focus is children's books that you know that's what you're going to attract you're going to attract what you have out in my opinion yeah yeah no absolutely I agree I agree well it's been fascinating talking to you Tiffany I've learned a lot today um so I know that you've got a book coming out this week as we're recording and I think yes so we're in the the beginning of September um so that's about to come out so that's finished so are you working on anything new so from when I came off break in July I put out this would be my fourth book since July. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I'm laughing because so it's so fast. It. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think I'm going to take a break and just, you know, let our holiday season go on. And I did, though, I did write and I hope I'll hold it and won't just like, I'm so bored just sitting here. But um, I did write Andrew Learns About Scientists. And so that will be the next Andrew book. So right now we have Andrew Learns About Actors, Andrew Learns About Teachers. Andrew learns about lawyers and Andrew learns about engineers. And so the next one is Andrew learns about scientists, which of course is inspired by my son who's in love with paleontologists. And I was like, I don't want to just do a book about paleontologists though. I think we should broaden it a little bit. So uh, scientists um, will be the next one after um, Fallon Favors Fall. That's the fall book coming out. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Wow. You are so busy. So where can our listeners find out more about you if they're interested in the books, but also in your author services? So my website is sugarcookiebooks.com and it has the page for the books and it has the page for the author services. Um, And then also you can follow me on social media, which is Instagram at sugarcookiebooks and Facebook at sugarcookiebooks. And I have to say, I have to applaud someone who was able to brand me, if you will. So when I first got into the game, I had my name, Sugar Cookie Books. But IG and Facebook said two different things and my website. So she was like, why do you have so many names for all your, you need to streamline. And I was like, oh, so I love that she gave me that um, advice, free advice at that to streamline because I do see people who have like, you can follow me here at this name and follow me there at that name. But no, everything is sugar cookie books. Can't go wrong. (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. Well, I will be sure to link to those in the show notes. Tiffany, thank you for your time today. It's been lovely. Enjoy the rest of your Labor Day holiday. Thankful. I don't know if you have it, but yes, thank you. 
If you're a first time novelist who is struggling to either finish your novel or get those revisions to where you want them to be, then I've got just the thing for you. I have a small group coaching program which runs over 12 months and over the course of that program I will help you fix those plot problems that you've been struggling with. I'll help you get under the surface of your characters so you really get to know them and what's driving them. And crucially for you, I give you that self-belief that you need to get you through the roller coaster that is writing a novel so that you can carry on get to the end and get your book, your story out into the world so it can change people's lives. If that sounds good to you, if that is something that you'd be interested in doing, I know I can help you get to where you want to be. So book a call with me. Let's have a chat and see if we are a good fit for each other. If you're interested in doing that, then go to emmadesi.com forward slash story builder. I look forward to chatting. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found that helpful and inspirational. Now, don't forget to come on over to Facebook and join my group, Turning Readers Into Writers. It is especially for you if you are a beginner writer who is looking to write their first novel. If you join the group, you will also find a free cheat sheet there called Three Secret Hacks to Write with Consistency. So go to emmadesi.com forward slash turning readers into writers. Hit join. Can't wait to see you in there. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.